The life of Pythagoras is surrounded by myth, and the stories about his eccentric life would prove to be as famous as his supposed mathematical discoveries. According to one famous legend, Pythagoras was walking through town when he passed the local blacksmiths, hard at work. The sound of their hammers ringing against the anvils filled the air, and to Pythagoras' ear, they were all harmonious and beautiful, except for one. He rushed into the shop where he began testing the hammers, soon realizing that the pitch that rang out was directly proportional to the size of the hammer, and the most harmonious hammers had weight ratios of 3 to 2 and 4 to 3, the same frequency ratios as the perfect fifth and fourth in music. Like most ancient stories, it quickly falls apart when you take a closer look, but it reflects that whoever Pythagoras was, he deeply believed in the power of math to explain all phenomena in the universe. Though many of the discoveries attributed to him were known in earlier times, the legendary figure of Pythagoras as a mystical, musical, reincarnation-teaching, vegetarian wise man had a major influence on ancient Greek philosophy. In fact, he is even credited with coining the term philosopher when he humbly rejected the label of sophist, or wise man, preferring to be known simply as a lover of wisdom, a philosopher. He is thought to have believed that rational numbers and the ratios between them could explain everything in the universe and that even the orbits of the planets produced an inaudible music known as the harmony of the spheres that could only be heard by the soul. Hey, I'm Matt, you're watching Nothing New, and today we're exploring the philosopher that everyone's heard of from math class, Pythagoras. Thankfully, this won't be as boring as grade school geometry since Pythagoras is actually one of the most mystical and spiritual of all the pre-Socratic philosophers. By the Middle Ages, he was said to have been the founder of math and music outright. But why did he get all the credit? Was he even a real person at all? That's what we'll be exploring today. But first, want more videos on ancient philosophy? Make sure to subscribe and hit the bell. We got new videos coming out every week. Anyways, let's get into it. The idea of harmony is one of the most important and enduring ideas that has come down to us from ancient Greece. Whether we're talking about the golden mean of Aristotle, the balanced architecture of a Greek temple, or the god Harmonia itself. The ancient Greeks have seemingly always recognized the importance of balance and harmony in the universe. The ideal of having a sound mind or level head associated with moderation and self-control was called Sophrosyne, a virtue which Plato related to the Pythagorean ideal of Harmonia. Philosopher A.C. Grayling tells us that, it was the musical discovery that the consonant intervals can be expressed as simple numerical ratios that is the great legacy of Pythagoreanism. The idea of harmonia, harmony, opened a set of conceptual possibilities which proved to be very influential. It suggested that opposites can be brought into harmony or can produce harmonies in their interactions, not least by blending, as when wet and dry, hot and cold balance each other or taper each other's excesses. Indeed, the idea of temperament in early medical science, the harmonious balancing of the choric, phlegmatic, melancholic, and sanguine humors, was held to be constitutive of good health. The concept of temperature as a relation between hot and cold, and the ethical doctrine of the mean as the virtuous middle path between vicious extremes, thus courage is the middle path between cowardice and rashness, all owe themselves in one or another way to the idea of harmonia. It is not too much to say, wrote the historian of ancient philosophy John Burnett, that Greek philosophy was henceforward to be dominated by the notion of the perfectly tuned string. For the Pythagoreans, as for others, including Plato, the idea of harmony came to have more than just the mathematical significance of ratios producing consonants. It became a key metaphor in thinking about matters ethical and psychological also. Just by itself, however, without further philosophical applications, it represents a notable step. Pythagoreanism lasted into the Roman period, and Pythagorean writings remained popular well into the Middle Ages, as the figure of Pythagoras quickly morphed into an archetypal wise man soon after his death. As I discussed in my video on sacrifice and magic, link below, check it out, many supernatural powers and stories were attributed to Pythagoras, probably for the same reason as why he was credited with so many mathematical discoveries. Pythagoras was the first of the pre-Socratic philosophers to literally gain a cult-like following. While we may group certain pre-Socratics into schools, like the Milesians and Eleatic schools of thought, 
that is only for the convenience of grouping like-minded thinkers together. Pythagoras is the first to actually have had a school of students, though it more closely resembled a monastery than an academy. Through his followers, known at first simply as the Pythagoreans, his legend grew to divine proportions. However, if you knew your history like Herodotus did, you'd recognize that he gets more credit than he deserves. Herodotus knew the philosophy of Pythagoras had Near Eastern roots, and tells us how the Egyptians are the first to have maintained the doctrine that the soul of man is immortal, and that when the body perishes, it enters into another animal that is being born at the time. And when it has been the complete round of the creatures of the dry land and of the sea and of the air, it enters again into the body of a man at birth, and its cycle is completed in 3,000 years. There are some Greeks who have adopted this doctrine, some in former times and some in later ones, as if it were their own invention. Their names I know, but refrain from writing down. This may be surprising to anyone who only knows the Pythagorean theorem, but as Porphyry tells us, he was really known for his spiritual teachings more than math and triangles in antiquity. The following is a matter of general information. He taught that the soul was immortal and that after death it transmigrated into other animated bodies. After certain specified periods, the same events occur again. That nothing was entirely new, that all animated beings were kin, and should be considered as belonging to one great family. Pythagoras was the first one to introduce these teachings into Greece. We can see that, while it may be unclear what Pythagoras discovered, it is actually pretty clear what he taught. So how do we separate fact from fiction? If it's too good to be true, it's probably not. And if it sounds like an oversimplification, it probably is. He didn't have a golden thigh. He didn't discover math or music itself let alone any of the innovations credited to him. And any saying attributed to Pythagoras, such as the Golden Verses, is almost certainly a creation of later Pythagorean thinkers, since he most likely didn't write any books or treatises. But he did exist. Or at least, I'm pretty sure he did. I'm just a YouTuber after all, but I do think people can go a little overboard with their skepticism of the past. Did Socrates say every single thing Plato put in his mouth? Probably not. But that doesn't mean Socrates was a character invented out of thin air. I don't see a reason to doubt the dating of his life to the 6th century BC, and I think it's almost certain he had a school of followers who he taught most, if not all, of these ideas we've been discussing. While those ideas surely had a Near Eastern origin, we'll never be able to know who was the first to truly discover them. So what do we know about his school? According to Plato and Isocrates, Pythagoras was most famous for being the founder of a way of life through his school in Italy. We should remember that while philosophy is seen today as something abstract and outside of daily life, in antiquity, and particularly by the time of the Hellenistic period, philosophy was seen as a way of life, which, when practiced, showed one not only how to live well, but also how to die well. Initiates in the school of Pythagoras had to take a vow of silence and secrecy. Specifically, new students could not speak for the first five years, and in general, they were not allowed to tell non-students about what they were learning. Despite this secrecy, we do have an account from Diogenes Laertius of some of their many precepts, as they were famous for their strict rules and rituals. At first, the rules seem random and irrational. Don't stir the fire with a knife. Don't step over the beam of a balance. Don't sit down on your bushel. Don't eat your heart. Don't help a man off with a load, but help him on. Always roll your bedclothes up. Don't put God's image on the circle of a ring. Don't leave the pan's imprint on the ashes. Don't wipe up a mess with a torch. Don't commit a nuisance towards the sun. Don't walk the highway. Don't shake hands too eagerly. Don't have swallows under your own roof. Don't keep birds with hooked claws. Don't make water on nor stand upon your nail and hair trimmings. Turn the sharp blade away. And when you go abroad, don't turn round at the frontier. This is what they meant. Don't stir the fire with a knife meant don't stir the passions or the swelling pride of the great. Don't step over the beam of a balance, meant don't overstep the bounds of equity and justice. Don't sit down on your bushel, have the same care of today and the future, a bushel being the day's ration. By not eating your heart, he meant not wasting your life in troubles and pains. By saying do not turn round when you go abroad, he meant to advise those who are departing this life not to set their heart's desire on living, nor to be too much attracted by the pleasures of this life. The explanations of the rest are similar and would take too long to set up. 
Scholars have compared the Pythagoreans to the other mystery religions, like the Eleusinian Mysteries and Orphism, which held that the soul was buried in the body as if it were a tomb, a punishment for mortals that requires the purification of the soul to gain release. Since he believed in the immortality and transmigration of souls, and was so concerned with the purity of his soul, the Greek astronomer Eudoxus tells us how, Pythagoras was distinguished by such purity and so avoided killing and killers that he not only abstained from animal foods, but even kept his distance from cooks and hunters. He didn't even eat fava beans, perhaps because they were flesh-like, perhaps because it was thought the plant connected Earth and Hades, or maybe because it made you gassy. Can't risk losing any of that breath of life, though it may have meant the end of Pythagoras' life. According to legend, he allowed himself to be killed rather than trample over a field of beans. His philosophy of reincarnation has not only been compared to the religious beliefs of Egypt, but also India, and so it's not surprising that later stories have him traveling to and studying their cultures. As we've said, he was actually more well known in ancient Greece for these spiritual beliefs than the mathematical advances attributed to him, which is why he's often described more as a mystic or shaman than a proto-scientist just like other pre-Socratics such as Empedocles and Parmenides. Anyways, that's all for today, but first, I want to recommend a video for you to watch if you'd like to learn more. Pythagoras and his Weird Religious Cult by Let's Talk Religion. He goes into more depth into the Pythagoreans as a philosophical movement than I did here. And in general, his videos are always very high quality and have really been an inspiration for me in starting this channel. If you like my channel, I'm sure you'll like his. I'd also like to welcome the new subscribers I've been gaining over these last few weeks, and say thanks for all of you who've been commenting. It always makes my day seeing what you guys think about these videos, and if there's a topic in particular you'd like to see me cover, please let me know. Coming up next week, we're going to be continuing our exploration of the mystical and magical through a discussion on the various mystery religions of Greece, and their use of trance-inducing rituals and substances to produce religious experiences. That's coming up next week. I hope you're excited, and I'll see you then.